Hey, Kermit Weeks here, Fantasy of Flight. And uh, what do you say we go do a little Kermit cam in the Stinson L1 here? Um, if you remember, we ended up bending a rod here because the oil in a radial engine, after it shuts down, tends to, you know, collect down into these lower cylinders. So I gave uh, Jack McCloy, my uh, AI here, a, a phone call just a second ago to see if he could maybe get some wrenches. We're going to pull these bottom plugs. Hey, Jack. So, yeah, just go ahead and we'll, we'll undo those, you know. Yeah, so these, these are the critical ones right here. So we'll see where we got oil. Oh, really? This one or these two? Yeah, both oh. of these two. Because of the way the cylinders are arranged, the, the oil will collect in these two cylinders because the intake pipe is actually the low point over here. Uh -huh. These cylinders here, as they go up, your, your exhaust valve is here, so the, so the exhaust is low. And when the oil collects in the bottom, it'll run right out the exhaust on this side. I but on see. this side, it collects in the intake pipe. If you don't pull it through or you don't catch it, the oil is laying in the in, uh, intake pipe. It fires. Right. Now it fires and it sucks right. all that oil in the cylinder and bang. That's what we happened it's because the, the, the intake pipes are in the back here. Right. And what we ended up doing was... If you can see this little thing here, we just added this because we went to start it the other day and we didn't have it off. So this little thing comes off here, removed before flight. Let me get the light going here. Okay, so that comes off. And if you look up there, there's a little deal right there. And this actually goes up into the deal, the intake pipe, two of them. And if we undo it like that, it drops down and it basically closes that off. So what we've done is all this oil is actually, we haven't flown it in a while. This thing's been draining and all that oil has been dripping out, not so much through the cylinders, maybe a little bit, but yeah. also a lot through the... It's through the cylinders. It's through the cylinders, but also into the intake tube. Well, it goes through the cylinders and back into the intake tube. Yeah, and what, what happened was, is we had pulled the plugs and we had actually turned the engine through by hand, and then we actually ran it through with a starter, and we thought, oh, everything's okay. There was no oil in these bottom cylinders. Put the plugs back in, and there was oil back inside the intake tubes, and so when we went to start it, and it fired, it sucked all the oil from the intake tubes, and apparently, I mean, most engines we don't have problems with, but this one's got a problem. And, it, and it, it's different engines, different manufacturers, it doesn't, You've got two two eighteen twenties, one on the Wildcat, one on the Duck. The Wildcat never locks up. Really? The Duck will lock, lock up within thirty minutes. I'll be darned. It's just the internal clearances on the engine. Okay. Well, anyway, so the bottom line is, it's something that we have got to watch, and in this case, we're going to go to a little bit of an extra effort here to make sure there's no well in here because it took a long time to do that. So go ahead and yeah, let's pull the pull so the plugs and. Uh, so we just, you know, breaking the leads there and we spin those off by hand and... Now I know a lot of people are asking, you know, I mean, this is easy. You can get to this and you can pull it through by hand, but... All right, now what do you do with freaking airplanes like that, okay? So basically, Jack, on airplanes like the Sunderland where we're out over the water or you got a DC-3 or something or something that's really big you can't actually turn through by hand. They basically got a clutch Correct. on a starter. Yeah. See, the, 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 the key is all the starters have a clutch. Right. They, they will all break, break free. The problem is if you don't motor them through long enough to pull all that, then, then the engine can fire. And, and additionally on this, you, the, the engine will fire because the, will run because there is no oil in the cylinder. It's in the intake pipe. And right. When it fires, it, it comes in. Right, and then it locks so up. So there's really, your, your only really safe way to do it is, is to pull it through and listen. And you can hear the gurgling. If you hear gurgling, stop. Just, just stop. And then pull the plug. If you pull it through, if but, you pull but it my through, but yeah. my point is on a Sunderland, you can't pull it through if you're in the water. So you just have to you have turn to it through, like 15 blades, as well, I, I think, remember. If I remember, it was 30 on the on the Sunderland, wasn't it? Oh my God, I'd have to go back and look at the deal. Was, but I mean, we would turn it through lot. a number of blades to make yep. sure if there was going to. But the reality is, it's still going to come if there's enough oil in the intake tube, it's well, still going to lock it see, up. See, the difference with the Sunderland 
and, and really any nose nose gear airplane. See how the engine's tilted on the DC? Right. On the C-47? Right. You're, you're leaned back, so the oil is going to run to the back of the cylinder. Where ah, the I are. see. On the Sunderland, yes, it's level. are sitting flat. I see. <coughs> That's why there's no tail drag or four-engine flying boats. <laughs> I, I just got that, okay? I just got that. Okay, that was the not the plug jack no, drop, but the, the but the deal. <laughs> okay, so okay, so we got those out. Yep, and I can so we're gonna there. we're gonna manually pull it through. Yep. Okay, I'll let Jack do that while I video and watch. Switches are off. I got to do my job. Yeah, throttle back, mixture off, yep. fuels off. So this is the normal procedure. We'll pull this through. You know, at least six blades, which basically means you've gone through the cycle one and a half times because the cylinders fire every other revolution. So he's listening for gurgling. Um, the boil in the cylinder, not whether or not he had chili on his uh, scrambled eggs this morning and it's in his stomach. Okay, so that seems pretty cool. And then, so now, and we know for a fact that there's nothing in the intake tubes because we this has all been drained out. We've closed that little right. deal there. But Jack, you were telling me you got like this other little special thing. A lot of times yeah, you I say you look in with I a flashlight. A, if if you see if you if you look in with a flashlight and you see oil in there, you can't you can't get it out. Uh, I use a, a syringe. A syringe, okay, like with a, a turkey little... baster. Yeah, okay, and it's great, just a okay. long hose go in there, suck the oil out of the cylinder. Okay, good. But if you can see it, yeah. If you well, can but see the reality it. is, is whether you can look at it or not, why not just stick it in there and just see if you can get something out of it? Works too. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, well, that's great. I've never, I've never heard of that before. So, that's a, that's a Jack patent, I think. So, <laughs> I'm going to give him credit. Okay, so we're cool there. We know the thing. The thing's back in. We've got the little red flag out. Removed before flight. So we're going to go ahead and. Yeah, I closed it, which is down. Get rid of the pans out of the way. One of the things that I always do is, like if we have an airplane that is just in the hangar here, I just leave the rear chalk in. Then when we bring the tug back, we know exactly where it was. Then it gives us something to shoot for. So that's that. Pick up all of this stuff. Little spider wants to go for a ride. Yeah, hopefully we can fly before that comes. Oh my God. Welcome to Central Florida during the summertime. Okay, so these are, you know, they've got a torque on them, but the reality is if you've worked on them enough, you kind of know exactly, you know, what, what it takes to tighten them down. Yeah, just snug is all you need. They've got little copper washers in there. And, and then these just, these don't have to be tight. They just need to be a little bit snug because, uh, you know, the little spring there is in there and it's... Well, you don't want them coming off. Yeah, you don't want them coming off. Yeah, I just, there you go. Just pilots get pissed. But they're not, you don't need to safety them or anything like that. Okay, so that's all done. We pulled it through. And uh, I know we... Uh, Put oil in it yesterday because so much of it had drained out. Did we check the oil? Checked it this morning. Okay, great. Okay, checked it this morning. We know we got plenty of fuel. When we get it outside, we'll sump it. But the, the, the fuel gauge on this one is pretty accurate, but I don't trust fuel gauges. And, uh, you know, if there's a possibility of having like a dipstick or something, that's always the surefire way. So, all right. Oh, I guess. We gotta go get a tug. Let me go get the tug. That little line right there, that was my idea. And he picks it up high enough, I can see it. Isn't that pretty cool? Like a gun sight. All right, everything looks clear on both sides. too sharp otherwise you bend the tow bar with the and I'm not going to
to say we've ever done that before. I've never done it. Okay, he'll pop this off. This one, for some reason, this airplane has got really tight deals on there, so we have to pop it off and then stick it back on again. see a little bit of a you know a mark where the tail wheel is so anyway that works so okay so let me do a bit of a walk around um, maybe if you would jack at least just drain the sump again okay so the sump here is right here actually I can smell it. It's not water, it's fuel. Yeah, let me just show the viewers at home what we're looking for here. You know, what happens is water weighs more than fuel. And so if there had been any water in there, it would show up in the bottom. And obviously, if there's water in the tank, it's in the bottom of the tank. And that's where you pick it up to where it goes to the engine. And that's not a good thing because it doesn't run very well on water. Human bodies do, but airplanes don't. So anyway, so we're just looking for little, I'll just start here and we'll go around this way. Looking for, uh, you know, oil leaks, different things, fairings, cracks in the exhaust stacks. Make sure all the cowling's buttoned down, removed before flight. It's always a good thing. That's the pitot tube. So this is going to tell us, uh, this is a ram air pressure for uh, our... Uh, 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 airspeed indicator okay and then these little holes on the top here are actually a static source so it basically there's no pressure there because it's going you know the winds going per parallel perpendicular to the holes and so basically it just determines what the ambient pressure is now if I go and get in the airplane when we look at the manifold pressure gauge it'll tell me basically what it is and probably today it's 29 and a half inches of manifold pressure or, or uh, inches of mercury Okay, this, this is all cool. This airplane has uh, slats, okay? The Fiesler Storch has slots. And the one on the Storch, those are fixed on the Storch, so those are called slots. Slats, these actually go in and out as the airplane uh, basically uh, slows down. And what happens is, as the, as the uh, you know, everybody knows that basically it's thrust forward, drag back, lift straight up and drag it, drag, gravity straight down, okay? So what happens is it's always that way. Gravity is always straight down, so when you measure lift, it's always, uh, you know, parallel to, to opposite of gravity. But what happens is when the airplane flies along, it actually has to fly at a certain angle. It gets some lift from the curvature of the top, you know, and the, and the, and the bottom tends to be a little bit flatter. If you can look here, it's kind of hard on the deal there. But basically, the uh, the bottom part of the wing is kind of flat. There's a curve to the top. But the wing creates this lift, basically, by flying through the air. It's just like your hand flying outside your car window when you go down the, the highway when you were a kid. I still do it, actually. But anyway, so what happens is, is but as the angle goes up, okay, on the wing, the, the lift doesn't go perpendicular to the wing. It still goes perpendicular and, uh, you know, are parallel and opposite of gravity. So you can see what happens is, is, is this goes up like this, and this is here, and effectively what you've got is a, uh, uh, if you look at the wing, and you go perpendicular to the wing, the higher the angle gets, obviously the less lift you got, because now if the wing's at a 45 degree angle, you only really have, the wing's only 70% exposed to the ground that when it's flat, okay, because of the sign of, 45 degrees is 70 percent or whatever anyway uh, of one so basically as you're flying along what happens is this 
vector is this way, but if you break the vector down on the wing, there's actually a vector perpendicular to the wing, but there's also one going forward because it's in effect, you're looking at it this way, it's like tilted forward. So what happens is that's actually how the process of auto rotation works on a helicopter. So what's going to happen? So if you, and if a, as long as you have an angle on a wing that basically is at an angle and there's air coming out this way, it actually pulls forward. You're not going to believe this, but if you pull enough G's and you break this wing off, it actually breaks going forward. You don't see it because the wing goes backwards, but the load is this way on the wing. And that's how a helicopter can auto rotate. That's how an auto gyro works. So what's going to happen on here, these aren't connected to anything other than the fact that they've got a little bit of a bungee that goes in and out to, to dampen them. But what will happen is when I start increasing the angle of attack on this deal, they, because of that lift vector moving forward, the higher angle I get, they're automatically going to come out on their own. Uh, so we're looking for, you know, fabric damage, looking for cotter pins, you know, to make sure everything's got cotter pin. I mean, we, you know, Nobody runs in my hangars and, and uh, takes things off, but you know, basically these are all things that we would, you know, look at, checking this condition of the struts and overall condition of everything. Everything's looking pretty good. Um, this actually has a. Uh, this doesn't have like a trim tab. Uh, like some of the airplanes do, they have a trim tab that basically, you know, uh, trims out the elevator. On this one, the whole horizontal stabilizer goes up and down. This is basically set for flight, which I'll use for zero. But as the airplane, and especially when I start slowing down, you know, I'm going to make some slow passes coming down the runway. You know, I've got to crank the trim in there. And, of course, when you add flaps, that makes a big trim change as well. Tail wheel, looking at all the things, and cotter pins fabric stuff, you know, make sure everything wiggles, rudder, kind of a little, we have, Paul put all these original zippers in there for the inspection, which is exactly the way they were originally designed. Now this is basically, they call this an elephant air, it's basically an aerodynamic balance, and you can see as if the air moves over the, the, the control surface here, obviously if you go to push this up like a uh, a rudder on a boat, this would take pressure to move this up against the air. But what happens since this part is forward of the hinge line, this actually, the air is pushing down on this, so it abs actually helps alleviate some of the pressure. Uh, you know, we would incorporate those sometimes onto aerobatic airplanes to lighten the controls and stuff. Kind of looking at the same things over here. Let's look in the back. And we got Grand Champion Warbird at this with Center Fun a couple of years ago. And you can see all the cool, we've got the very pistol, you know, shooting the cartridge. There's a manual hand crank for the, you know, starting the deal. So a lot of the original radios, they don't work or anything, but they wired them all up. Paul came up with all the original, kind of the orange wiring, you know, with the, the way it was. This is a, a control stick that sits back here, but right now it actually flits into the little lock. There. I just want to make sure that everything's back here. And, Seat belts locked back there, so it's not going to get caught in any controls. It's got rudder uh, pedals basically back here, rudder things, but they, they don't have any brakes. There's a wobble pump, throttle mixture. Uh, the guy in the back has got flight controls, uh, but no brakes. Um, anyway, a lot of the original radios and stuff up there, you know, the original switch. We even got the original mic uh, microphone up there. We don't use that at all. Anyway, and just as a little side note here, one of the things, this thing was set up, you could actually lay it up as an air ambulance deal, so you could see how the, the top here, you know, could pop off and you could put a litter in there. But one of the things that we did to continue with the history of the airplane that's pertinent only to this airplane, normally this would have been flat all the way back here. This little ring back here is unique only to this airplane because it was... Uh, used for all the filming when Frank Tallman had it in the Great Waldo Pepper and a lot of other things they did. So they actually put this ring back here. They would take this off and they'd put a 35 millimeter camera back there, which back then were pretty freaking big pieces of equipment. Fuse box right there. Little map stowage and all that stuff. Really cool. Paul did a great job restoring this airplane and we were duly rewarded. 
Okay, just looking for the condition of everything. Cotter pins. Slats on this side. Okay, so at this point, I am going to leave you now with this camera and I am going to go with the helmet cam. We got the, the helmet cam here, so we're going to go ahead and put this thing on here. That deal, I don't know if I can wear my hat, I'll probably wear it backwards. I assume, yeah, there's some kind of a, a uh, ear protection here. Okay, so basically, a little bit of a cockpit check here. The, uh, I'll just take this off for now. Oops, lost my hat. Okay, so over here, we've got the rudder trim, which is right here. The elevator trim is here, which is actually, like I was saying, this actually runs the stabilizer up and down in the back. So that's down. See, nose down trim, you crank it that way. Nose up trim is here. And basically, we use zero for takeoff, okay, and it was set back there. Down here on the left side, uh, we basically got the, uh, we got the throttle, okay, that's open there, mixture, that's rich, that's lean, this is the propeller control for adjusting the, uh, the RPM, which we will watch on this gauge right here, okay. Um, fuel, uh, we're going to put that on main, and basically I'm just going to put it on main right now because it's full. If I was getting low and I was concerned about it, I would put it on uh, reserve. So if basically what happens is if you're flying along and the engine quits on main, then you go to reserve. It's basically a standpipe if the tank's this big. The reserve is about here, so basically once you get the reserve, you know, hey, I'd better find an airport or a road to land on. Uh, this is the wobble pump, which we'll use to wobble up fuel pressure when, before we start it. Down over here is our little flap system, which basically controls the flaps, and it's got a little switch here that flicks back and forth, and I don't know what it is, up is basically there, and the flaps are obviously up right now, so when I push this, it's hard. But if I go ahead and clip it to the, the down position right there, and I start cranking, look what happens to the flaps, okay? So the flaps start coming down, and that's basically how the flaps work. So we, for the first takeoff, I'm going to go ahead and just take off with the flaps all the way up. So they're just manual. And also, I don't know if you noticed that or not, but look out there at the ailerons. The ailerons actually start coming down at a little bit slower rate than the flaps, okay? I mean, isn't that fascinating? So let me get the flaps all the way down. Okay, so I'm going to wiggle the stick back and forth here. See, the ailerons still work, but they're actually part of the flap system as well. So we flip this thing back up. And it's all done manually. Okay, that's that. Okay, so that, everything I do when I do a cockpit, before I take off, I always go from left to right. So that's there, that's set. Uh, you know, if I want to start putting them down, if I wanted to, I could leave it down like that, unless the thing fall down. And the next thing that I'm gonna do is to put the flaps down. So set that, that's zero. Wobble pump, that's set at zero. This is all set the way it's supposed to be now. Now, we knew we were gonna uh, basically fly this thing. Normally on this engine, we would actually always run it up at about 1500 rpm uh, before we would shut it down and we would cycle the prop back here because like on a t6 the the you, you don't want the the cylinder exposed to the elements so what we do is we go to the coarse pitch thing which basically closes that off it puts it inside leaves it in oil but uh we actually ran the airplane yesterday because we haven't flown it in a long time so we left it that way but normally we would start it off here let it warm up, let the oil pressure build up in the engine for like 30 seconds or so to make sure there's oil in the engine. Then we would go cycle the prop uh, to where it would go to, uh, to fine pitch. And if you did it sooner than later, what would happen is a lot of that oil that was being pumped into the engine would just be going up to the dome, which we don't care if the dome's got oil in it at this point. What we care about is the fact that all the moving parts have got oil in it. So that's, uh, that's uh, a good thing to know. Here's the mag switch off. 
you know, you got basically both right, left. I don't know what the hell battery, what's battery for? Originally, the airplanes didn't have a master switch. The, the, the mag switch was, a, was the master switch I and see. the mag switch. So okay. the first position is battery. Right, okay. Which is your master switch. Okay, anyway, so it's off at this point, and right now our battery, which I've never used that, is right here, and if you listen to it, you'll see it. You can hear the little solenoid click. So anyway, so there's our battery switch. Uh, generator switch is back here. It's on, a little bit of a panel here. That's just the temperature gauge. We don't need any of this. We don't have any AC for the inverter. Don't need the running lights it's in the daytime. Uh, pedo heat we don't need. Uh, because I don't expect any icing conditions today on my pedo tube. Uh, fire signals, oil dilution. I don't even think this is hooked up. It's just there like the microphone to look good. This would have been lighting and stuff, you know, and we got these nice little shades in here. Um, anyway, so uh, voltmeter, amp meter, you know, for the electrical. This over here is uh, carburetor heat control, and right now it's in the cold position. You can't see it, but forward is hot. Push this little button in, and you can adjust that up there. So cold is where we fly, because that's basically ram air, and that's basically the ambient air coming in and being used in the carburetor. If for some reason you got in a situation, icing conditions or something like that, where, uh, you know, high moisture and certain conditions basically there's a possibility of getting carburetor ice okay now that can be good or bad because uh, in a carburetor there's a venturi okay and it's basically like two airfoils put together and when the air goes into it when the engine sucks air through that throat that carburetor venturi that's the opportunity to allow the air to go through, but it also creates a vacuum to suck the fuel into the uh, the system being metered by the you know the throttle and the and the mixture over here, and uh, because you're accelerating the air because there's less pressure, uh, like on the top of a wing, when you expand air, it cools, and when it cools, it has the potential to ice up. Okay, now if you happen to be on the road somewhere and you find out that you really want ice with your naked and Jamaica drink, well then obviously there's a positive benefit to that if you need to. So anyway, enough of that. So here we got the cool panel, cylinder head temp, got the altimeter. I usually, when I fly here locally, I always zero it, you know, to the zero. And like I said, we're basically at 144 feet. So this is gonna tell me, if I set this to 144 feet and the altimeter is reasonably accurate, Okay, that's like 144 feet. I'm basically at about 30 uh, point, you know, 0.08 uh, inches of nano, uh, 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 inches of mercury. Okay, and when I start the engine, um, let's see if I can find the manifold pressure gauge right there. See, so it's pretty close. It's kind of, you know, it's within about three tenths or something like that. That's pretty good. When we start the engine the uh, crankcase pressure is gonna be less than this and it's gonna go down to about 15 to 20 depending on where I've got the throttle. So this is our altimeter. Uh, that's where we set our ambient pressure. So right now I'm just gonna set it to zero because I don't care about this because I'm not worried about hitting a mountain around here. I'm hurt worried about hitting the ground. When we used to fly competition aerobatics, we would always set the altimeter to zero, regardless of where we were, because I wanted to know where the ground was. I didn't know not know where the airport was, what the elevation was above sea level. So here's a triple pressure gauge. We've got oil pressure, we've got oil temperature, and we've got fuel pressure. And as you can see, there's little green arcs here with red lines as to where the little needles should be when we're flying. This is our RPM gauge. Uh, tachometer, so that basically 2300 is going to be our takeoff thing. I've had some problems in the past where I've actually flown the airplane when we were first doing the test flying. Uh, the government, governor was not set properly and it started to overspeed, so I, was, I would have to manually pull this back to keep it from overspeeding on takeoff. And then once you get back into cruise, I'm going to be cruising around about probably 1900 RPM or something like that. Manifold pressure gauge. I can't remember, is this got a, is this got a, this not have a blower on it, does it? Okay, so all, it's normally aspirated, so this is all the manifold pressure I'm going to get. So I can go to full throttle, that's the maximum that's going to get. And as I go up in altitude and the pressure changes, this will slowly drop, even at full throttle. Now, the cool thing about having a supercharger, and especially like on a P51, it's a two-stage, two-speed, 
you can actually take off with more manifold pressure than the ambient pressure, which is what this is right now. And on a Mustang, you'd actually take off at 61 inches of manifold pressure. So it's like got double the boost of what I'm breathing right now. This is your, uh, is that the carburetor temp? Yeah, that's free air right there, and that's that temp gauge that, that I clicked back there. That's your carburetor air temp. Uh, here we've got our airspeed. We don't worry about a red line. Well, it is. It's got a red line of 160 miles an hour, and that's basically you know a structural limitation. This airplane cruises around about 90 or 95, so that'd be like going straight down. Uh, turn and slip indicator tells you if you're you know going sideways. Uh, like if you were on a bank turn in a car on a racetrack and it was a 45 degree bank turn, well, if you had a slip indicator in there, if you were going too fast, your car would feel like it was going to go off to the outside and this little ball would go this way. But if you were actually going and you were going around a 45 degree turn and you were going too slow, you would be leaning to the inside of the turn and like the way the airplane's leaning a little bit to the left, that's why. Uh, that's lean in there and then this tells you if you're turning to the right or to the left and this little bars right here They do standard rate turns which man it's been a long time since I've done any instruments I think it's a two-minute turn For 360 degrees So if you held that right there and put that little thing there and turned around there it would take you exactly two minutes to do a 360 degree turn that's our uh, rate of climb indicator. Okay, so that would be a thousand feet a minute going up This airplane won't do that. It would go and down uh, you know, if we put the nose down, got a clock, got our wet compass, needs a little bit of fluid in there. And it's, well, we're sitting tail low right now, but basically it's not reading exactly after I'm headed almost due north. That's our fuel gauge, and it's actually reading a little low right now because we're tail low. When I get in the air, it might go up a little bit because of the way the, the thing's located. This is our fuel pressure warning light. So if, a, if all of a sudden I started running low on fuel right here, this thing would start flickering. And before the engine quit, I could switch over to reserve, start hitting the wobble pump, and do that. So anyway, so here, I'm going to put my little helmet thing on here. And also, too, these, these uh, brake uh, rudder pedals actually have an adjustment to where if you push these little things in right here, I can adjust the pedal forward or backwards, and uh, we can do that. So I think I'm going to fly without my hat, Jack, just to make it easier. Um, but I do have some sunglasses if I need them, so let me get those out. Okay, seat belt. Seat belt. Okay, carburetor heat's cold, primer unlocked, Get a little bit of wobble pressure. So we're looking to wobble up some pressure here. And after a while we should start hearing fuel squirting into the deal. Yeah, there we go. That's got a lot of fuel. Man, that worked out good. Okay, I gotta get the door shut. So we don't blow that away. So we're gonna turn on the master switch right there, the battery. All the little gauges come up. That's the fuel warning light. And we're gonna go ahead and push it up to a mixture rich. And this has an energized engage system right here, the switch. And when I flip it up, I'm gonna energize the starter and it's gonna wind up the, uh, uh, the energized starter. It's got some weights in it. And then when I go to uh, engage it, it'll clip and it'll clip like a cam in it. Wham, it'll start spinning. And then once it starts spinning, I'll, then I'll turn the mags on. So here we go. We'll see if it'll start on the first try. We're going to energize it. That's just the starter spinning up, not the engine. Should say zero right now. Crack the throttle slightly. Clear front. more fuel. Okay, that off, give it some more fuel. Get some 
pressure. Man, we got a leak there. What happens is, you see, you can tighten up that little nut there. See, I just fixed it actually by screwing that right there. Here we go, energize. Flare prop. There we go. Looking for coil pressure. We got oil pressure. That's the first thing we look for. Theoretically, I'd take off if I had a round airfield that way, but we'll take off this way. 